Good evening. Here we are yet again for another lovely session of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. This is going to be the 17th lecture in the video series, and today we're going to be looking at an example of applying the method of virtual work to trusses. So let me work out an example problem, and I just want to work it all the way through from start to finish, seeing how to apply the method of virtual work to, the, to find the deflection in a joint on a truss. So again, uh, method of virtual work, trusses, example. Four trusses, example, an example. So uh, the following will be given. Now, we could use a much more complicated truss if we wished, but obviously the more complex the truss you will use, the more uh, involved your work you'll be. So I'm just going to start with, a, for this example, I'm just going to work through a very simple, uh, or relatively simple, five-member truss. And for something more complex, or larger truss, it would be the exact same method, just something that would take a lot longer. And this video is going to be long enough as is, so I thought I would work with a relatively simple truss, just to get the uh, principles across. So I'm going to have a truss that's like this. Let's see, so let's start with a five-member truss. And I also get, decided to give us some nice friendly dimensions. So we're going to have a truss like this. And it's going to be pinned here and a roller here, roller support here. Pin and a roller. Now the loads on this truss uh, I'm going to have a 10 kit point load on the far end. A 10 kit point load on the far end. And in terms of the dimensions, well, this is going to be, uh, that's going to be 12 feet from here to here. And the vertical height, or just the height, will be 8 feet. And if you think about this, uh, if this is 8 feet and this is 12 feet, oh, and also I will tell you, or I'll tell us that the uh, horizontal distance here is 6 feet. So this is probably already popping out at you, but all of these uh, slopes are going to be nice 3, 4, 5 slopes, uh, just to make the math a little bit simpler. So again, because this is the halfway distance here is 6 feet, which means if this uh, horizontal distance is 6 feet and the height is 8 feet, that means we're going to have 3, 4, 5 triangles on all of our slopes. Again, just to make things a little bit simpler. Uh, but of course, this would work for any configuration. Uh, 3, 4, 5, and 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5, and 3, 4, 5 here. And I'm also told about the materials, or I'm also telling us, giving us the materials for this thing. Or let me get the, get the dimensions first, or dimensions, the uh, cross-sectional area. Now, if we were designing this truss in real life, we would also want to know the moment of inertia and the act, actual cross-section, uh, because we'd have to consider things like bending and uh, it, that kind of thing. But for this, we're considering this an ideal truss, so really the only cross-sectional property that matters is a cross-sectional area. So I'm going to go ahead and give those to us. I'm going to say that we have a cross-sectional area on the horizontal members of 4 inches squared. So the top cord and bottom cord will have a cross-sectional area of 4 inches squared, and our diagonals, our web members here, will have a cross-sectional area of 3 inches squared. And area here equals 3 inches squared, and on this one as well. And then the final missing piece is the material property or material properties, and I'm just going to say all members are steel. Which will produce a, or which in turn, will have a, um, will have an elastic modulus of 29,000 KSI. Nothing surprising there, this is our standard uh, modulus elasticity for steel. And I want to find the, uh, I want to find, uh, oh, let me also give us the joint names. Now you could call this, the actual joint names are 
uh, immaterial to the actual method, but uh, just for our uh, namesake here, just for our uh, terminology here, I'm going to call these members A, B, C, and D. And so all this is given, and that should be all of the information we need to solve this truss. And uh, find, let us find the vertical deflection at joint A. I want to find the vertical deflection at joint A. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, so this is going to be a little bit complex, but we can handle that. So I'm going to be applying the formula that we developed last time. And um, this formula is going to be, again, remember, 1 times delta equals, and I'm going to write it slightly differently than I did last time, but I'm going to write it like this, sum of virtual, in, uh, sum of virtual forces internal times uh, the actual internal forces times L divided by AE. So one kip or a unit force applied to uh, times the actual deflection, the real deflection, um, a unit to force times the actual deflection on a joint is equal to the sum of the forces internal caused by that unit force at that joint times the real internal forces times L over AE. So the this uh, FVI is going to be our virtual internal forces and FI is going to be our real internal forces. So um, basically most of our work is just building up all these pieces. So step one, I'm going to find the real forces in the system. Find the real forces in the system. or in our truss. So let me draw a brief free body diagram here. Just gonna draw a brief free body diagram. And so we're gonna have our truss here and reactions. I'm gonna draw a free body diagram of the truss including reactions. And we have A, B, C, and D. And let's see here, 10 kips. And I'm gonna have a CY here. And a DY here. No great surprise. And this is gonna be, let's see, a three, four, five. As you mentioned previously, uh, with four on the vertical, three, four, uh, five. And a three, four, five here. And a three, four, five here. And uh, this again is going to be uh, 12 feet and six feet. 12 feet, six feet, and uh, eight feet on the vertical. And that's our full free body diagram at least for all external forces. Now, uh, all we need to do is basically find, okay, so backing up, this is our real system. In other words, this is the actual geometry. Well, that's not gonna change between the virtual and the real. What distinguishes, again, what distinguishes the virtual from the real is that the real is using the actual loads that are applied to the structure. Now, I could show a CX here, but that's clearly gonna be equal to zero because there are no horizontal loads applied to the structure. Now, um, so again, our real system is the, the actual geometry with uh, the actual real loads applied to it and real reactions. And then the virtual system is going to be the, uh, is going to be uh, the truss with its actual geometry, but with a unit load applied on the joint of interest. And so um, I actually, when I was setting this up, I deliberately chose to find the deflection at this joint rather than this joint, just to drive home the point that we are not, we don't have to apply our unit deflection, or sorry, our unit load at the joint uh, where actual loads are applied. There are no real loads applied to this joint, but when we actually do the, uh, when we get to the section on the virtual system, we are going to be, we're going to be applying a unit load on joint A, because that's the joint of interest. 
So now we just need to find all the real forces. We just need to use, uh, this is just statics at this point. We can use whatever method that we want to find the, uh, to find the forces in all of our members. Now, I decided I am just going to go ahead and do this on camera. I could just write down the answers and say, it's statics, go ahead and use that. Um, I decided just for the sake of completion to go ahead and uh, show all of my work from start to finish. Uh, if you are already very comfortable with solving uh, for forces inside trusses, and by the time I get to, you get to this point, hopefully you are. But uh, if you want to fast forward uh, at this point, that'd be a good point. Uh, this would be a good time to do it. But I'm just going to go ahead and solve for all of the internal forces anyway. So uh, based on the global free body diagram, oh, not global, global free body diagram, I'm going to do a balance of moments first. And so I'm going to do a sum of moments about D. Uh, and I'm going to use this to get my first reaction. A sum of moments about D counterclockwise positive. I will have negative CY uh, causing a negative moment. Because uh, again, clockwise times a moment arm length of 12 feet. Uh, and then uh, moments about D, uh, when I'm taking moments about D, DY will not cause a moment there, of course. And then uh, minus 10 kips times a moment arm length of six feet, all of this is equal to zero, and CY then will be equal to uh, negative five kips. Negative five kips, which of course is five kips downward. Five kips downward. So this is actually opposite the direction that we usually associate with a pin support. And that's because if you think about this, this is a cantilever truss. So if you th imagine trying to rotate this about this thing, um, this force, this 10 kip force, is trying to make the entire truss rotate like this, and we need a reaction force to balance that out. Then if I do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, I will get uh, negative 5 kips from the CY, uh, minus 10 kips from the load on the right, plus DY, all this is equal to zero, and DY then will equal 15 kips upward. A positive 15 kips or 15 kips upward. So we now have our uh, we now have our CY and our DY. So then um, again, we could use any method of our choice to find the rest of the member forces. We could use method of sections. Uh, well, method of sections or method of joints are going to be our primary choices. I'm just going to proceed to solve all of this using using the method of joints uh, for simplicity. Well, let's see. I'm going to start with joint B here. I'm going to have an FAB uh, here. And I, as I always usually do on the method of joints, I usually just start by assuming everything's in tension. And then if I get a negative, I know I am in A, uh, then I know I have compression. So FAB, FAB here. Uh, and then I'm going to have FBD at a 3, 4, 5 angle. Uh, 3, 4, 5. And I could just, oh, and of course, my 10 kip downward force here. Then doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction on this joint, I will have negative 10 kips minus FBD times four over five. Again, finding its vertical component uh, times four over five. And then solving for FBD, if you solve that for FBD, you will get that FBD is equal, or not three equal signs, not defined as, looks like a P there. FBD is equal to negative 12.5 kips, which will be in compression. And I really encourage you to keep these as a uh, positive for tension and compression negative, because later on we're going to be multiplying things together. And uh, if you get, uh, for example, if your virtual system uh, has tension, then you're going to be multiplying, a, uh, if, say your, let's say your virtual system had a, uh, tension on a member and your uh, real system had compression, well, in that case, you're going to have a positive times a negative, and it really is important that those are, have opposite signs. Otherwise, the math really won't work out properly, and you'll have uh, some issues. So then, uh, doing this, so we got our first member force. Then, doing summation of forces on the x direction, I'm going to get negative FAB, our unknown negative FAB, uh, minus FBD, times 3 over 5 is equal to 0. And if you substitute this in here and solve for FAB, uh, you will find that FAB is equal to 7.5 kips uh, positive, which is tension. So we have our first, or sorry, our second member force. 
And this doesn't surprise us. If I see this great downward load here, th this massive 10 kip load here, I would actually expect this member to be in compression and this top cord then to sort of be in tension resisting that. So this is a case of negative bending, usually with simply supported uh, trusses. It was something like a simply supported truss with a middle load, for example. We would expect the top cord to be in compression and then the bottom cord in tension, but because this is a cantilever truss, the thing is going to be largely in negative bending, so we would expect the top cord to be in tension and the bottom cord to be in, in compression, so no surprise there. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to joint C, but of course you could use whatever joints you like. So joint C here, this is where we have our external reaction, our downward 5 kip reaction. So we have joint C here, and I'm going to have uh, my 5 kip downward force, 5 kips downward, and FCD is going to be to the right and FAC is going to be upward. Again, assuming everything in tension initially, with this being at a 345 angle, or 345 slope, triangle, whatever you want to call it. 345 here. Then uh, I'm going to start just by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction, so I have only un one unknown that way, the FAC. Uh, so I'm going to have FAC times 4 over 5 um, minus 5 kips is equal to 0. And if we solve that for FAC, hopefully you can solve a simple algebraic equation like that. If not, oh boy, you got uh, bigger problems. <laughs> but FAC is going to be equal to 6.25 kips, uh, which will be in tension. 6.25 kips in tension. Then summation of forces in the x direction is going to be FAC uh, times 3 over 5 uh, plus FCD is equal to zero, and I would substitute in my 6.25 kips for my FCD, or I'm sorry, for my FAC, so times 3 over 5 plus FCD equals zero, and FCD then will be equal to, uh, if you solve that, you will find that FCD is equal to negative 3.75 kips, which will be uh, compression. So negative 3.75 kips in tension here. And so we have uh, now two, uh, four of our five member forces, and we just have one remaining force, and that's going to be FAD. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find this by looking at joint A. But of course we could do any number of joints. Well, not any number, there's only uh, four joints altogether, but uh, I guess we could use joint A or joint D, but let's just go ahead and use joint A because that's what I have in my notes here. So looking at joint A then, uh, I'm going to have my uh, 6.25 kip force in tension here, My uh, that is my FAC here, oh, joint A is up here, and uh, so again 6.25 kips, 6.25 kips, and this is going to be at a 345 angle, and I'm also going to have FAD uh, also at a 345 angle. I can manage to draw a right triangle. Also at a uh, 345. And then um, I'm going to have my 7.5 kip tension force in the horizontal direction here along our top cord. And that's going to be 7.5 kips. And I can just do a simple sum of forces in the uh, vertical direction. That's going to be equal to negative 6.25 kips times 4 over 5, to get the horizontal component of it, uh, minus FAD times 4 over 5 is equal to 0. My 4 fifths cancel out. Solving that for FAD, I'm going to get negative 6.25 kips, which is in compression. Negative 6.25 kips, which is in compression. Now, moving along, I want to move on and look at my virtual system. So I've, worked, I've found all of my real member forces, and now I need to find my virtual system, or find the forces in the virtual system. 
And so if you remember back to the previous video where we went through the theory of this, uh, when we talk about the virtual system, we're going to be applying a unit load. And the unit load depends on what your unit system is. I'm working with kips and inches here, so all of my so my unit load is well anything but a small load. It's a it's an entire kip, a thousand pounds. So it's uh, when I so a unit load is kind of a misnomer, but the same method still works. And so we're going to apply a unit load on the joint that we're interested in. So again, apply unit load of joint on interest, or apply unit load on joint of, of interest. And that unit load depends on what unit system you're using. If I used, if I wanted to apply unit load of one pound, I would have to go and say, okay, well, I'm going to convert my, uh, I'm going to apply my uh, modulus elasticity instead of using kips per square inch. I would use uh, pounds per square inch. I would use 29 million pounds per square inch instead of 29,000 kips per square inch. Um, and if you were wanting, if you wanted to use kilonewtons, you'd have to use a. If I was using um, Kilonewtons, for example, at, well, I'd have to use, make sure my moment of inertia, sorry, my modulus elasticity was in uh, kilopascals rather than megapascals or gigapascals or something. So again, you have to be very careful with your units here. It's very easy to uh, screw up on your units. So the exact definition of a unit load is going to depend on your unit system. But apply unit load uh, to the joint of interest. Uh, joint of interest in the direction of interest. Okay, so um, let's go back to our truss here. And again, on the virtual system, all of the other loads disappear. All of the real loads disappear. So the geometry is exactly the same. It's still three, four, five, that's not changing. But what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna have a one kip load here. Now, as far as why I chose downward, um, well, looking back at this, I'm just making an assumption that it's downward. Uh, that's, you know, I can assume either way. I could assume that's upward, I can assume it's downward. But uh, in most of the cases on vertical deflections of trusses, I'm using them. I'm used to them being vertical. Uh, I'm, I'm used to them being downward, so I'm just going to go ahead and assume a downward load at joint A. And if we get a negative number, that means, that doesn't mean that the load is, is downward, that just means a, uh, in this case, if you get a negative final number on our deflection here, that's going to mean that our direction is opposite whatever we assume. So I'm then going to, so I'm just going to go ahead and assume downward, um, but uh, we, we, uh, it, this is an interesting enough problem that it could end up either positive or negative. So I'm going to have a CY here and a DY here, a CY and a DY. And I'll go ahead and show my dimensions on here. This being 12 feet, uh, 6 feet, again, for some sake of completion, 6 feet and 8 feet. And then our angles. Uh, in the vertical is, well, we have four in the vertical, three in the horizontal. Uh, three, four, and five. And three, four, and five. And notice my real load at the end of here is nowhere to be found. This is the virtual system, not the unit, uh, not the actual real system. So we don't care about what actual real loads are applied. We're interested in the vertical deflection at joint A, so we're applying a one kip load at joint A. Oh, I should probably put a, not just a kip, but a one kip there for completion. One kip. And for, again, for the sake of completion, I'll just go ahead and put all my joint names on here. A, B, C, and D. So I'm gonna then go and find my joint, uh, all my uh, member forces and my reactions. And um, I'm gonna actually find the reactions by doing a sum of moments about joint A. Uh, although, actually, you know what? I could do it in any number of ways. Um, but looking at this here, I could do a, if you do a sum of moments about joint C, uh, counterclockwise positive, so not, joint, not about joint A, sorry about that. Oh, let's see, I would have negative one kip times six feet uh, plus dy. Uh, times a distance of 12 feet equals zero. And if you solve that, you'll find that dy 
is equal to, oh, if I don't jump ahead, uh, dy is equal to 0 0.5 kips upward. Then, if you do a sum of forces in the vertical direction, you will find, uh, again, uh, let's do minus 1 kip for our unit load, plus 0 0.5 kips for our dy, and plus cy here, you will find that cy also equals 0 0.5 kips, up, uh, if I can quit jumping ahead, uh, 0 0.5 kips upward. My computer seems to want to do that with this uh, writing pad. Uh, 0 0.5 kips upward, so we have our reactions. Then uh, let's go and find all of our member forces. Let's look at joint C first. Uh, let's consider joint C. Again, uh, if you uh, if you want to jump ahead here, you can. I'm just applying statics to find our member internal forces. But feel free to jump ahead if you're very comfortable with that or if you don't feel like uh, watching me work through the entire thing. Uh, so joint C here, I'm going to have at my 0.5 kip reaction force and FCD and my FAC here. And this, of course, will be at our same 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5. Then I can do a sum of forces in the vertical direction. Uh, first, sum of forces in the vertical direction, I will have FAC times 4 over 5 uh, plus 0 0.5. And solving for this, um, uh, plus 0 0.5 equals 0. And if you solve for FAC, you will find that FAC is equal to negative 0 0.625, or sorry, 0 0.625 uh, kips, and that's going to be uh, compression. Let's go ahead and erase that, but uh, 0.625 kips, which is compression. And then sum of forces in the horizontal direction. I'll have 3 fifths times FAC uh, plus FCD is equal to zero, and FCD is equal to, uh, will be equal to negative three-fifths FCD, it will be equal to negative three-fifths times FAC, I should say, uh, which is equal to negative three-fifths times, uh, let's see, that's times negative 0.625, and if you multiply that out, you will find that FCD is equal to 0 0.375 kips which will be in tension. So we have our um, we have our first two member forces, FCD and FAC. Next, I'm going to move on to joint A. Uh, joint A here, and joint A will be as follows. We have our uh, mem our force F. As AC, which is 0 0.625 kips compression going into the joint, 0.625 kips. I have FAD, which is currently unknown, and that's at a 345 angle. And then I'm going to have FAB going to the uh, left here, or sorry, going to the right, just assuming tension, of course, and I'm going to have a downward load of one kip, my unit load here. Again, all of these are our member virtual internal forces, our virtual internal member forces. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to go ahead and do a sum of forces in the vertical direction uh, is equal to, uh, that's going to be equal to 0 0.625 kips upward, so positive, and this, of course, is 3, 4, 5 times, uh, let's see, to get the vertical, that's going to be times 4 fifths uh, minus 1 minus FAD times 4 over 5. All that equals 0. And if you solve that, remember FAD, uh, that's going to be equal to negative 0 0.625 kips which is also in compression, negative 0.625 kips in compression. Then, uh, summation of forces in the x direction, 
uh, I will have 0 0.625 times 3 fifths uh, plus FAD uh, also times 3 fifths uh, plus FAB is equal to 0. And when I substitute, uh, well, something, uh, when I substitute an FAB, something really interesting is going to happen. Times 3 fifths plus negative 0.625 times 3 fifths uh, plus FAB is equal to 0. Look at this. I have 0.625 times 3 fifths and minus 0.625 times 3 fifths. This goes away and this goes away and I'm left with FAB is equal to nothing, is equal to 0. There is no force in member FAB. And in turn, if I look at joint B, joint B here, I'm going to have zero kips on the horizontal number and I'm going to have my FBD here at a 345 angle. And so if this is zero kips and this is FBD, well, if there's nothing to resist, if, if I know this is zero kips already and FBD is here, well, there's nothing to resist a horizontal force uh, generated in this. So if I do a sum of forces in the x direction, I can clearly see that FBD is also equal to zero. FBD is also equal to zero. So next, on the next slide, I want to fully draw out my real system and, a, and my virtual system to sort of uh, really summarize what we have so far. So I'm going to draw out the full uh, real system and virtual system. This isn't strictly necessary when solving this, but it can be, uh, it can be useful in certain cases. So our real system. And these are, as a reminder, going to be our F sub Vs. Our F sub Vs are our real uh, member internal forces. And then we'll have our virtual system. And this is our FVI, our virtual internal member forces. So I'm going to draw the same truss in both cases. Here. And same truss here. So we can see that we're going to have very different loading on our virtual system and our real system. But again, the geometries are exactly the same. I'm going to uh, skip from drawing the, uh, uh, the dimensions on here because I think we've done that uh, enough for one day. But I will go ahead and draw the joint labels on here. So A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and D, and A, B, C, and D. And D. So I'm going to show all the loads and forces in red. Um, in the real system, I have a 10 kip load uh, applied to the right hand uh, side of the truss, or the farthest most point on the truss. And here I have a 1 kip or unit load uh, downward at joint A, because that's the joint I'm interested in knowing uh, our uh, deflection at. So I found, as we found previously, we have a 5 kip uh, reaction here and a downward reaction here, and a 15 kip upward reaction here. 15 kips here. And then uh, I'm going to have, uh, let's see here, this is going to be uh, 6.25 kips in compression. So I'm just going to show all of the member forces on their appropriate members. Uh, sorry, in tension here. 6.25 kips, and I'm just going to use positive and negative here, positive for tension positive 6.25 kips and positive 7.5 kips uh, for tension. And this uh, number uh, CD is in negative 3.75 kips, which is in uh, compression. And then this member here, AD, is going to be in negative 6.25 kips. Negative 6.25 kips in compression 
and db or bd here is negative 12.5 kips in compression so we have our so how this truss is behaving we have the largest compressive load um, right where this thing is bearing down on it or right where our applied load is bearing down on it it's under a hell of a lot of compression and the rest of the truss is basically trying to keep the thing from toppling over then we have a much more interesting load i think in our unit case even though it's less complex i think it's kind of neat uh, we have a 0.5 kip upward load at c and d a 0.5 kip load here and here and then i'm going to have a negative uh, 0.625 kip load on my two diagonals here uh, a six point or 625 pound uh, compressive load if i want to think of it that way in pounds rather than kips negative uh, 0.625 negative 0.625 kips like this and 0 0.375 kips in tension here and on these two members here i have zero kips and zero kips so basically these two members in my virtual system are carrying no load or more importantly more specifically the load is actually bypassing them altogether. the load is coming straight down from this uh one kip load being delivered to these two um in compression and then uh get being, de being delivered as reactions here and here and this member here is just to resist the outward thrust of the one of the uh, compressive loads here and here and that's how the system is behaving structurally and so we now have all of our uh, loads and the rest is just putting it all together all right so i'm going to now uh, move on to the final step and that is to work through the mathematics of actually calculating the final uh, joint displacement here so um, I'm going to do this in tabular form. Usually that's going to be the most convenient method for working through uh, virtual work for trusses. So I'm going to create a table and it's gonna, I'm going to lay it out as follows. <clears throat> so I'm going to have my member, which I'm just going to call N. And this is going to take up most of the slide. But really, this is mostly just uh, substitution at this point. Substitution, plugging and chugging. Uh, this is going to be L in inches. Uh, area. Um, let me do A for area, the cross-sectional area. Now, note, uh, I do want to do my length in inches. Um, I, it is absolutely imperative in this type of problem that you use compatible units. So. Um, previously, when I was working through finding member internal forces, it didn't really matter if I was using feet or inches, but for this problem, because my area is in square inches and because my, um, <clears throat> my modulus elasticity is in kips per square inch, KSI, it is imperative that I convert my member lengths into inches. Uh, then the area, the cross-sectional area is inches squared. And I don't really need to create a, a column for, mo for uh, modulus elasticity, but this would be important, especially if you had, uh, oh, sorry, it was KSI here. This would be important, especially if you had, uh, let's say members made of different materials. Like maybe for some reason you had a truss that uh, was a mixture of steel and aluminum, or if you had say a, a, a mixture of concrete and steel members, although that was concrete, you'd have to get into, and then its behavior as a composite material, but let's not worry about such things right now. <clears throat> okay, next, I'm going to have a column for my F internal. That is the, uh, that this is the real member internal forces. FI, is my, as I've designated, is the real member internal forces. And this is going to be in kips. And then, I'm going to have a column for uh, FVI, which is the virtual system member internal forces in kips. And then finally, I'm going to have a column that is really the multiplication. <clears throat> and this is going to be FVI times uh, FIL over AE. And interestingly enough, if you, you, this would be fun to prove to yourself, actually. I would encourage you to do this. If you multiply kips times kips, uh, the force times the force times inches for the length, and divide by inches squared and KSI, you will find that this has units of kip inches. And 
if we remember back to the previous video, this was basically, or this was fundamentally an expression of work. And it should not surprise us that the final uh, units for our ultimate multiplication here uh, would have units of a distance and a force. And force times distance, of course, is a unit of work or energy. So um, we see that we actually do end up with a unit uh, equivalent to work um, here. Uh, so I'm just gonna go down and list all my members. A, B, A, C, uh, C, D, uh, A, D, and B, D. Actually, maybe I'll give myself a little more room here. A, C, or A, B, A, C, uh, C, D, A, D, and B, D. And this really is plug and chug at this point. So the length here, all I've done is calculate the member lengths and turn these into inches by multiplying by 12, of course. So this is 144 inches. AB is 12 feet long or 144 inches. AC is, uh, is gonna be 12, is gonna be 10 feet long or 120 inches. And then the same thing here, 144, uh, 120, and 120. And then the cross-sectional areas these were given um, for our uh, two uh, for our horizontal members, <clears throat> we're gonna have four and four, and then for our diagonal members, three, three, and three, uh, three inches squared in each of them, and twenty-nine thousand. Uh, again, for the E, I could really do without this column, but just for the sake of completion, I thought I'd include it on here uh, in case you're working with a system that has uh, multiple materials present. Uh, 29,000, 29,000, and 29,000. And interestingly enough, if you wanted to do this method using a, let's say, a concrete member, the easiest way to do that would be to use the method of transform sections. Uh, method of transform sections, again, where you could convert a, uh, find an equivalent cross-sectional area for the combined steel and concrete. That's how you could handle something like this. And then uh, the member internal forces here for the real system uh, again, this is uh, just I'm just combining things or rewriting things that we got from earlier. Uh, 7.5 kips, 6.25 kips, negative uh, 3.75 kips, negative 6.25 kips, negative uh, 6.25 kips, and negative 12.5 kips. Then the virtual number forces are going to be zero, negative 0 0.625. Uh, 0 0.375 and negative 0 0.625 and finally 0. And the rest of this is just multiplication. So to get this number here, I'm going to multiply the two forces, then multiply by the length and then divide by A and E. And because I have a 0 here, that's just going to come to 0. That's of course just going to come to 0. And then this here, if you multiply this force times this force times this length and divide by this times this, you will get a value equal to zero, negative 0 0.005388 kip inches. And CD here, you will get negative 0 0.001746, also kip inches. And if I can manage to write a six properly. And then in our third uh, member, or our third, or I, guess for, I suppose our fourth member here, you will have 0 0.005388. And this member here is zero. So if you remember back to our overall formula, um, going back here, the ultimate formula we're applying is this here. A unit load times the real deformation, this is what we're ultimately after here, is equal to the summation of FBI times FI times L over AE. So now we just need to go and do a summation of this column here. We've already done all of our multiplications. All you need to do is just do a addition here. <clears throat> and that, because this is a relatively simple truss with relatively simple loading, uh, this is we end up with relatively simple uh, summations here. And so this term cancels out this term, and we're just left with this deformation here. And so we end up with this. We end up with a summation of negative zero point zero zero one seven. Four six kip inches, and the final slide. I just want to go back, and I just want to go forward and uh, interpret this result. 
So the final summation, the summation of fi, uh, fi l over ae is equal to negative 0.00746 kip inches. So I want to go back to our formula of 1, a unit load, times delta equals the summation of fi, uh, sorry, fvi times fi l over ae. Basically, equal to that, all this equals to the real deformation over AE. And uh, this is actually a unit load of one kip. And we're not just interested in any delta, though. We're interested in the delta on the, cha the, the change or the, the displacement on joint A in the y direction. On joint A in the y direction. And that comes to uh, everything on the right side, as we've already established, comes to 0. 0.00. Uh, 1746 kip inches and kips and kips will cancel out and the one will go away leaving us with delta a y equal to negative 0 0.001746 inches now here is where we have to be very careful or here's we have to use a little uh, thought here so I got that a y the, the deflection on joint a in the y direction is negative or but is that what I really got did I really get that the deflection on joint a is negative or downward well we need to go back to what we originally assumed look at this here I applied a downward load of one kip a downward unit load on joint a because I just assumed that that deflection was downward um it doesn't actually have to be downward um, they could be upward, especially with, a joint, with this truss that is so, um, especially with the truss that is a cantilever truss. We don't necessarily, we're not necessarily going to have very simple deformations or very simple deflections. So, uh, like you would have, say, you know, if you had a simply supported truss and you had a single load in the middle, and I asked you for the uh, the deflection at the midspan, well, you're of course going to get downward deflection there. With a cantilever truss. Uh, depending on how the members are laid out in the loads, you could actually end up with either a upward or a downward deflection. So how do we know? Well, it comes back to what we assumed. We assumed a downward deflection, which means that that downward di direction is already fundamentally baked in to all of the equations we did. When we did the uh, reactions here, we assumed this was downward. When we got all of the internal forces, we assumed all of those were in relation to a downward load here. If I assumed an upward load, I would have the same magnitudes for everything, but everything would be reversed. Instead of having uh, compression here and here, I would have tension here and here, and these would be going, the, our reactions here would be going in the opposite direction. So we already have the direction baked very much fundamentally into all of our internal virtual loads. So this down, this negative number here does not mean that our final deflection is downward. What it means negative deflection, negative delta value. Therefore, the deflection is opposite the assumed direction. That's all that means. Just like we uh, often assume, like when previously, when we were working through all the member forces, uh, initially, I assumed everything was positive, or, or in other words, I assumed everything was in tension. And I knew that if I got a negative number, that doesn't mean I screwed up and I have to go back and do everything all over again, well, especially in this problem, that would be quite uh, <laughs> annoying. Um, it doesn't mean I have to go back and do everything over again. All that means is that my initial assumption was wrong. But more importantly, uh, now there are some assumptions in structural engineering that you have to really rework your work. Like, if, for example, if you assume something is elastic and it turns out it's not elastic, well, in that case, your assumptions are very wrong and you have to go back to square one. But uh, with this, if you ass if you assume one direction and you got the other direction, that's no big deal. It's just, just going in the opposite direction. No big deal. So in our case here, what this means is that our final de uh, deflection, uh, delta AY, is going to be equal to 0 0.001746 inches, not downward, but upward. So uh, joint A will deflect upward uh, 0 0.001746 inches under this loading. 
And I would like to give a note on deflected shape of trusses, just as a final follow-up note, or a final concluding note on this. So what's going on here? Again, I initially assumed uh, downward because that's what I'm used to assuming on trusses. Usually on trusses, I tend to assume downward and uh, sometimes to the right or the left, but especially downward because that's what the reflections you usually have. But we had this large 10 kip load. So if I were to draw the deflected shape, uh, joint B here, this is definitely going to move downward. But as it moves downward, it also has to rotate along this joint here. So it's actually going to move more down and to the right. So deflected shape looks kind of like this. And this shape here, this truss member here, is going into tension. So it's going to stretch out like this. So it's actually going to stretch out kind of probably like more like this. So we'll actually end up with a positive, but only a slightly positive, deflection on joint A here. And then we'd end up with something kind of like this is our deflected shape. Um, and then I suppose uh, something like this here for that member. But uh, really, all so again, this joint here is going to go down to the right, and in turn, everything else is kind of rotate, which is going to drive this joint, joint A, up and to the right as well. But really, that's it for uh, trusses and virtual work for um, for trusses. Uh, again, I can see that it is a fairly lengthy procedure to work through all of this. Um, really, I want you to see this as uh, just for a. Uh, it's very useful to know this, especially uh, just to get the idea of how virtual works works with trusses. And also to see how um, this is fundamentally a lot of what goes into uh, various structural engineering packages. So um, where you might use this in practice is if you have a piece of, uh, for example, if you had a piece of software that you weren't sure if you knew how to use properly, or if you were building a piece of software, um, especially if you were learning how to use a piece of software, you might create a truss. And uh, so you could create a simple truss in your model. And uh, if you, you want to make sure whether you, you're using the trust, the, sorry, the program properly or not, you could go and calculate the deflection on one joint manually and double check that against what you, the results you get from software. And if you got that right, well, if they match up, it, it means the program's working properly, most likely anyway, and it means that most likely you are using it properly. So um, anytime you're using a uh, piece of software, it's often very good to come back and, you know, work with a very simple case. Like if I was... Uh, for example, you, know, you could use like a simply supported beam with a point load and then all that kind of thing to check if a piece of software works properly. But uh, before computers, this is this is these kind of methods uh, were used very frequently to, act, to as really ultimate design in some cases for the design of trusses. But anyway, this is the method of virtual work for trusses worked out in a long form example. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found this a little entertaining or at least enlightening. Uh, that'll do it for today. And as always, thank you.